Next up is Peter Young, who also spoke at Farmhouse Conf 3. Um, who here was that? Who, who here was at that? Whew, it's been a long day. Okay. Um, how many of you, like, literally sat on the edge of your seat during that talk? Here you go. Um, that was a hell of a talk. So he, um, I'll just let you do it. It's fine. Peter Young. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Shane, don't go anywhere because i got to work you into my intro. Um, uh, last time I opened up my talk, first of all, it's weird. Um, I don't know if Megan and I have been formally introduced. I just moved to Boulder last week, too. Very weird. Um, so anyway, uh, la uh, I opened my talk last time talking about this anecdote of meeting Bill Nye when I was like 13 years old, Bill Nye the science guy, and how he had told me, uh, he was friends with my dad, and we were hanging out, and he said, Peter, he said, I want you to remember something for as long as you live. And he looked at me and he said, don't ever, ever, ever get a job. He said, it's not worth it. And I talked about how I've worked uh, less than six months of my adult life uh, since then. I'm very proud of this. Um, and um, follow up, what did Bill Nye say when you talked to him? You met Bill Nye, and you told, told him that he was responsible for an eco-terrorist going to prison or something. How did that go? Yeah, so, so Annika and I went to a filming of The Soup, and um, it was like their end of the year, let's invite all our friends over, and Bill Nye was one of the random guests. And I was like, oh, my God. Who you know? What are the odds? I've got to tell him Peter's story. And as we were like, he left before us. And as we we're leaving, he was like, st we got stuck in the elevator with him and his wife. And I was like, oh my gosh, thirty seconds. Um, There's this guy who you knew his dad in Seattle, and you, you told him never get a job. And then he later turned into this like um, eco terrorist, FBI fugitive, and then went to jail all because of you or something like that. <laughs> and he was like, that doesn't sound like advice I gave. I probably told him to own the distribution. I was like, no, 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 you told him not to have a job. Oh, listen, my memory is very clear on this. Bill Nye told me to never work for another man again. In any case, um, so I'm not going to get my whole talk again, but th that was actually very central to my story, this sort of turning point where Bill Nye cornered me. Right, so um, my last talk, my talk last time was fundamentally about being a fugitive, which is kind of a metaphor for collapse in that I, when you become a fugitive, you flee from the FBI, you're forced to start from scratch. You're supposed to take on a new name, uh, leave all your old friends behind, you can't call your parents, you're starting completely from scratch. And that's what I had to do. I lived that way for eight years. Um, and this was because I was fleeing um, animal enterprise terrorism charges. This is an actual charge. And I was on the run for, like I said, eight years for what we did in 1997 is we went to a series of fur farms. We cut fences. We opened the cages. We released those uh, mink into their native habitat. We did that six times. We were subsequently charged for those six fur farm raids uh, on behalf of the Animal Liberation Front. And I was looking at a maximum of 82 years in federal prison. So I soberly assessed the situation. I said, uh, I've got a lot of life left in me, and I'm going to fight for the life the government is trying to take away from me. So I went on the run. I was on the run for eight years. I was eventually caught in 2005 and sentenced to two years in prison. And that involved getting a new ID. I, had to, I lived in abandoned houses. There was a, uh, a number of ways that being a fugitive defined my life for a very long time. And what was really cool about the last talk that I gave at Farmhouse Con Conference 3 was that I was... Um, told by lawyers very firmly to never ever talk about those years as a fugitive because there could be serious legal repercussions. And I eventually decided I'm going to talk about it anyway. And so it was kind of my coming out talk last time. It was really good to get that stuff off my chest. It was stuff I've never been able to talk about before. I was never even legally allowed to admit that I'd ever knowingly evaded the law. That in and of itself can be a crime. So um, that's what last time um, was for me. But uh, what I'm going to talk about right now real quick, um, you have to ruthlessly time check me because I have a lot to talk about. So um, I... Uh, I talked about being a fugitive. What I didn't talk about is I've really been a fugitive three times in my life. I told you the first time. The second time was when I got out of prison, I was told that I could never talk about the years while I was a fugitive. So I was around nothing but people when they'd bring up, you know, where were you in 1998? I couldn't talk about it for legal reasons. So it was almost like being on the run all over again with a different, for a different time frame. But what I'm going to talk about is the part I couldn't talk about in my last talk, which is sort of how I felt like uh, I'd become a fugitive for the third time in the years since I got out of prison. I got out of prison in 2007. Um, and it's, it's another kind of fugitive status I've endured, it's another kind of clean break and starting new. And I'm talking about fleeing the sort of subcultural confines that I had been in for so many years, um, identified as sort of a cliche radical, which is something I never identified with. In a lot of ways, I was forced to conform to this. Um, it's really interesting if you get a lot of uh, social incentive for something like being in bands, 
how you can find reasons to be in bands for your entire life, well into your you know, 40s and 50s and beyond. Or if you get known for something as trivial as being a dumpster diver, as I was for a long time, that you can find reasons to continue being a dumpster diver even long after those tactics, that lifestyle has, has stopped serving you. And um, I think the best way to describe this and, and, this, and to capture this is, a, is an anecdote from prison. I, went to, uh, I was in jail in downtown Chicago, and um, I walked in this jail. It was a really bad jail, and I was there for like a couple months. And um, it was the first day I got there, this guy sat down and wanted to play chess with me. So we played chess. At the end of the chess game, and everyone's looking at me because they're all trying to feel me out and test me out and see what kind of guy I am. He, he goes to fist bump me. Actually, I need a volunteer. Will you come up here real quick? I'm sorry. So the guy, um, so he says, good game, man, and he killed me in chess, and he says, good game, and he puts his fist out, so put your fist out, and I'm sitting there, and the whole room is looking at me, and they're going to judge me based on what I do next, because they're all trying to scrutinize me. I didn't know what this was. I didn't know what he was trying to do, and I sat there, and I went like this, <laughs> and I'm thinking, what is this weird prison ritual, and I go, and the whole room busted out laughing, and I, what, what? The message here and what this said is that I had gotten 27 years into my life and never fist bumped anybody. Now, um, I'm not saying that you should ever, a, a goal should be to be around a lot of people that fist bump in a non-ironic way, but um, <laughs> what was really telling to, to when I look at the story is that I had, was so deep in my subcultural niche that I had never fist bumped in my life. I was 27 years old. I was so deep in the punk rock subculture that I didn't even know what, what, was, what that was. And it's staggering to me to think about now. And so a lot of the years since, I feel like I've been trying to break away from that and diversify my life a little bit. Um, so how am I doing, Shane? I, okay, so um, I got out of prison, and um, the, everything kind of crystallized. This need for me to diversify my life kind of crystallized. Uh, the need for me to get out of my punk rock subculture and diversify things. When I went, does anyone here know who Anthony Robbins is? I think a lot of us do. Tony Robbins, the kind of the, the archetype of like the cliche motivational speaker. When I got out of prison... Uh, I read some of the material in prison. I found it very useful. And when I got out of prison, he was speaking at Long Beach like Convention Center. So me and my friend went down there. We found a hatch in the service hallway. And we looked out, and we were on the scaffolding that went above the entire seminar. The seminar was $2,200, OK? Um, it was limited to like 500 people. We got up on the scaffolding and wound our way up four stories up above this crowd of 500 people. You just paid $2,000 to be there. And we positioned ourselves right above the stage. I spent two days at this seminar, and I got more <laughs> It's true. And um, I got more out of those two days watching this so-called cliche motivational speaker than every punk rock song I'd ever listened to combined. More practical, useful, actionable advice than I'd ever gotten from any punk rock song. Now, no offense to any of the lyric writers here whose lyric, you know, records I may or may not have listened to um, in high school. Um, um, but what, what was interesting is that the punk rock scene that I came out of told me to not look outside of itself. That people like Anthony Robbins, a rich white guy telling you how to live your life, and this is, um, you know, it, it, it enforced, it militantly enforced not looking outside of itself. And I got so much value out of this Anthony Robbins speech, this so-called cliche motivational speaker, that um, that was a moment I identify as sort of my, me making a break from my past, and that I needed to start looking outside of the punk rock zines and the punk rock lyrics and seeing what else was out there and exposing myself to new knowledge. Um, so I began to recognize the limitations of the subculture that I came out of. Um, and this kind of um, came to a head recently. I, I sort of think about a lot of my contemporaries that came out of the subculture I came out of, what do you call it, punk rock or you know, radical, whatever, and how most of them are doing the exact same thing they were doing 15 years ago. There's people like Shane who actually took the best parts of that subculture and did something great with it and built something cool. By and large, a lot of the people I know from that era are taking this shit to the grave. They are taking mediocrity to the fucking grave, and I don't think there's anything to be proud of. But for a long time, I was very proud of the fact that I was, I was, I was staying within these very rigid boundaries, and I, I thought I had a lock on the truth. And, you know, I look back kind of on the Anthony Robbins seminar as sort of a moment where I realized, you know, there's more out there than what I've been told in the punk rock subculture. Um... One minute. Okay, so um, where are my notes here? Um, I was recently uh, walking into Barnes & Noble. I found a magazine. I look at the cover. It's Inc. Magazine, a business magazine, INC. And I see a friend of mine in the cover, a girl who was an anarchist girl from Olympia. I knew 10 years before. She was a rabid shoplifter. A rat. She was a, just a, a classic anarchist girl. She's on the cover of this magazine. She's worth 
$200 million. She is a, I don't want to say her name. I don't think she wants the association with an eco-terrorist, so I will leave her name out of this. But we go way back. And we ended up talking on the phone recently. And I asked her, I said, do you ever talk to any of those people uh, from back in the day? And she said, you know, I try. He said, but, she said, but every single one of them is doing the exact same thing they were doing 15 years ago. And I, 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 we don't have anything to talk about. And fast forward, smash cut 24 hours. I was talking to another friend of mine who was a fixture in our, lo our local punk rock scene. And I asked him what he was up to and we were playing catch up. He was building a house out of stolen pallets on squatted property, playing in a punk rock band, going on tour, playing to 30 people every night, which would be cool. I'm principally very down with that, but that was exactly what he was doing 15 years ago. And I juxtaposed those two phone calls, and I realized um, how, um, in a lot of ways, I've become a fugitive from, from the confines of that era. So I will close um, by saying, um, let's all figure out how we can accelerate our own collapse. We should not be doing the same thing we were doing 10 years ago. We should not be doing the same thing we did three years ago. Um, and let's all figure out how we can reinvent ourselves and become reborn. Um, take the best parts of what we learned and parlay that into something big. Um, you know, I, I ended my talk last time like I'll end it now, which is, you know, the, the best lives go to those that break the most rules. Um, and I was referring to society's rules, but I'm also referring to the rules of your contemporaries and the people around you. So start with society's rules, then break the rules of your subculture. And whatever you do, you know, if it's been done before, then it's probably not worth doing. So thank you. <laughs>